Empirical provide compelling, interactive learning across a range of delivery options. Live on site, live online or online anytime, we have a training course that is ideal for you. For a no-obligations chat about your training requirements, contact us at empirical.com. With respect to SIP message characteristics, there's four main areas that we're going to discuss in this video. We'll start off with a look at the general SIP protocol stack, looking at what sits as a payload of SIP and also the transport protocols which can actually carry SIP. We're also going to consider the end-to-end -end message transfer process. We'll actually look at the composition of a SIP message and see how SIP proxies can be used to get that message from one point in the network to another. We'll cover off the key commands associated with SIP. Those are termed methods. And we'll also look at the potential responses that we can get back from a particular request. So let's take a look at the protocol stack to begin with. Now, SIP in normal operation can actually carry a variety of different payloads. Now, some of those payloads are highlighted on screen there. SDP and XML are very popular examples of payloads that SIP can carry, particularly in terms of the session establishment procedures involved with SIP. And as you can see, SIP can actually be carried over a variety of different transport protocols. UDP is a very common way to carry SIP, but you also may see it being carried over TCP and in some cases SCTP as well. And as you can see at the bottom of the stack, it might be IPv4, it could just as well be IPv6. There is a variety of SIP called SIP Secure, and that is just vanilla SIP with the addition of transport layer security in the protocol stack, which means we have to use TCP at the transport layer. In terms of the SIP messages themselves, they always take a standardized format. If you were to look at SIP on a protocol analyzer, you will always see, if it was a request, a request line. The response back, it wouldn't be a request line, it would be a status line instead. But let's just consider a request. You would always see a request line, and then you would see the actual SIP message body itself. So the request line always takes the same format. It, it comprised of the method, the request URI, and the version. So the method is the actual, the whole point of the request. What is the request trying to actually do? Is it a registration? Is it an invite for a session? The request URI details, well, who is this request ultimately destined to? And then the version is all about the version of SIP in operation. If you were to look in the message body, the message body is essentially comprised of a bunch of header fields. And it really depends on what the method is, which determines which header fields will actually be sat in the payload. But just to map this into a, a real example, that is what a typical request line would look like. And there is a typical message body. So in the request line, you can see it's an invite going to this particular request URI, and at the end, the SIP slash 2.0 is the version. If you look at the body, in brown are the various header fields that you may or may not encounter. Now, some of those header fields you will always encounter, some are optional depending on the scenario. Now, in terms of communication, SIP is always exchanged on a transaction basis between user agents. Now we're not necessarily talking about one mobile phone to another. It could be between mobiles, or it could just as easily be between a mobile and an application server. In those cases, the end parties are considered to be user agents, and depending on what's happening in the transaction, the device can function, the user agent can function as a user agent client or a user agent server. So here on the left hand side, we've got a user agent client in this case, sending out the request to a server, and in response, this, the response gets sent back from the server to the client. But it could just as easily be the other way around, where our user agent on the right hand side of the diagram becomes the client, and the user agent on the left becomes the server. It really depends on what's exactly happening in the particular session establishment process. 
However, it's not always point-to-point -point connectivity that we see there. In order to actually get SIP signaling between two user agents, what we actually might need in the path are what are called SIP proxies. Now, these are devices which are responsible for taking in a piece of SIP messaging and analyzing it, getting it on its way to the next SIP destination, the next appropriate SIP destination. So these SIP proxies could be in the same network or they could actually span different networks. So just to elaborate, user agent one generates a SIP request and sends it to an appropriate SIP proxy. Now that SIP proxy can analyze the SIP request. It may even use DNS to ultimately resolve the next hop. Now, typically we are routing on the request URI, but as you may have seen uh, in the previous slide, there is another header called the root header, which we could be analyzing as well to get this message ultimately onto its next hop and ultimately to its final destination before we can actually respond. Now, that end-to-end -end signaling could be just two SIP proxies in the path, or it could be many more than that. It just depends on who we're trying to communicate with within the confines of the SIP network. As you can see, the response takes the reverse path through the network. So any proxies which handle the request in the outbound, outbound direction will also see the response coming back the way. Now, in terms of what those requests and responses might actually be, well, the requests will always be what are called methods. And RFC 3261, the baseline SIP specification, introduced six different methods. We'll look briefly at each one in turn. So the first method, the first request that you may encounter is the register. This is used by user agents to register themselves on the network. Now, don't be confused. It's not a presence related thing. It's really just saying to the network, I'm here and I want to be registered for my services. And this will allow the network to create a binding between a particular SIP address and the contact details that that address can potentially be contacted at. So the register is used for registration. The invite is used to set up a session. Now that session could be between different terminals on an end-to-end -end basis, like different cellular devices, or as I said earlier on, it could be between a mobile and an application server, for instance. But it's ultimately designed to set up a multimedia session of some description. And when you do see an invite, it's not unusual to see the session description protocol being carried in the payload of that invite. Other methods, the, the ACK, the acknowledgement, is only specific to the invite. So if we send out an invite, the final part of the invite procedure that you see taking place, you would see an ACK method being sent, and that's the only time you would see the ACK. Other examples, the BY. So if we want to terminate a multimedia sub, uh, session, the buy would be used for that purpose. We also have the cancel method. So if we wanted to set up a session and then changed our minds, we want to tear the session down before it ever got established, we'd use the cancel to do that. And finally, we've got the options method, and this is used to query the capabilities of another user agent or perhaps a SIP proxy. In real life SIP networks, it's often used as a keep alive as well. So the options get sent out and the response to the options comes back. If we get a response, we know that the other end is receiving and processing SIP traffic. So these are the requests that a user agent can send out. What do we get back in response? Well, remember, the response will feature a status line rather than a request line. And the status line will feature one of these response codes. Now, typically speaking, responses can be provisional, so they'll always start off with a one, or they could be final, which they will start off in the case of success messages with a two. So you've got a few different examples of provisional responses there. There's only really one example of the 200 series, the final success messages, and that's a 200 OK. Now, if you're thinking that's quite similar to HTTP, you will be right. SIP is actually based on HTTP. So we've got provisional responses, which are temporary responses before we get a final response. And then we see, first of all, a successful 
final response. We also have redirect responses. So perhaps we need to redirect the sender of the request to a different resource or a different destination. And then we have the 400, the 500 and the 600 series of failure messages. The 400 series is really like a, a temporary failure if you will. So the 400 series failure will be sent back to the request initiator basically saying your request has failed so don't send me that request again in that format but you can try again. The 500 series uh, failures is basically a server failure where for whatever reason the server currently pr processing the SIP message is actually unable to process the message for whatever reason. And finally, probably the worst type of failure is the 600 series of global failures, which basically means this SIP request will never be able to be fulfilled. So just in summary then, we, see, we saw that requests and responses are exchanged between user agents. And we said that SIP proxies are often required to transfer SIP signaling between those user agents. We said that DNS can actually be used to facilitate this process, particularly if we're talking about routing SIP between two different SIP domains. The SIP methods that we discussed include the register, the invite, the acknowledgement, the buy, the cancel and the options methods. And we also talked about request responses and they included provisional responses, which was the 100 series, final responses, which was the 200 success series. And we also saw a bunch of redirect 300 series and failure messages, which were the 400, 500 and 600 series of messages. Need to know more? Why not visit our store where you can choose from over 200 hours of video based training. Alternatively, you can contact us to discuss any specific training requirements you may have.